I, I use this as a learning opportunity. I'm sure there's just as much I can, as I can learn from you guys as you can learn from me today. All right, so uh, as always, when I talk about networks, I need to talk about the people who've been doing this, sociology. <laughs> uh, so the first couple of reviews I got 2014-15 was always like, we've been doing this for 100 years. Why don't you cite our work? So I'm doing that now. Um, and in sociology and other, other sciences, Networks are often, can you guys hear me okay, by the way? Is the audio okay? I'm okay. University, usually I'm at home giving talks. Uh, these networks can be used as visualizations that are highly effective in conveying information that humans are less capable to read in matrix format. Obviously, any graph that you see here today encodes a matrix, just a little table of numbers, and we can turn this table, uh, we call that an adjacency matrix, into a graph. Uh, in this case, it's a weighted graph, uh, which has arrows, a direct, sorry, a directed graph, which has arrows. And this is a predator-prey network uh, of the Malaysian rainforest. And you guys got the message really quickly. You don't want to be animal four, pretty much, because it's eaten by, <laughs> by most things. Um, that's it. It just conveys effective information. If I show the matrix here, it's less uh, effective for, for most of us. Some people are better in understanding matrices. I'm not one of these people. This is another visualization of a, a actual company, the hierarchy, and then you can visualize who calls whom, how often. This is a pretty simple graph here, but just to demonstrate, um, you can see that Nancy is uh, officially a secretary, but unofficially is the person who receives most of the calls. And so if she were going to get sick one day, the company is likely to struggle more than if Manuel would uh, get sick in one day, probably. You also can see that Manuel calls Nancy, but Nancy ne never calls Manuel apparently. So <laughs> I don't know what that means, but um, so just a way of conveying some information. This is a network of a person. I think the person who made this graph actually, uh, and they are Facebook friends. And so you can see that you see some communities here of uh, his high school friends, his wife's friends from uh, college, uh, some intermediate friends and so forth. Um, so we can cluster these network structures in meaningful ways, and then try to learn from them. And this is from a, from a nice paper, I think end of the 90s about uh, people, I think it's a US high school or college sample of dating behavior. So as a 90s paper, it's a classically gender color coded um, and uh, all the edges here are dating relationships. I, and they're only drawn, I think, if both part, both people indicated that they were dating the other person. Otherwise, you would not draw an edge here. So just interesting. Some, some people are quite busy uh, in, this, in this graph. Um, so just the challenge here is really there's no statistics here. It's just visualization because all the nodes, the people, and all the edges, the relationships are known to us. They're part of our data set, right? So we just, the challenge here is just to visualize this. And this was a hard problem at some point because if I would give you the matrix and need to draw this, you would end up with somebody in the top left who needs to be now collected with, connected with the bottom right. But this has been solved by computers a long time ago. So it's quite trivial. Okay, now the chapter I've been working on the last over the few, last few years, it'll be the shortest chapter because you guys are here, I think more for the network modeling part. But um, to me, statistics are, motivated by theories. I think there should be in many cases. And so I want to devote a little bit of time to this today. Which also will show you how short network models I talk about fall in embracing complexity. They're really very simple tools at the moment. And I think we uh, need not forget that they are very simple tools, very blunt tools. So this is a flock of birds, as everybody knows. And the flocking behavior is an emergent property that comes out of interactions of individual birds. And I think that's a really nice matter for, for variables in psychological data. Uh, our variables are three-dimensional also. We have people, uh, we have time, and we have variables. And so each of these birds is a, a sad mood item that goes over time in a certain person or a personality item. And if we know anything that we agree on in psychology that these items tend to cluster over time. <laughs> We know that the big five might not be a true thing, but we know that neuroticism items tend to cluster together and depression items tend to cluster together. And people better in one cognitive ability are on average better in other cognitive abilities. So we have correlations in data. And now the question is, where do these correlations in data come from? 
And there are two simple answers. Both are mostly wrong, but uh, I will have 45 minutes today, not a week of a workshop. So we will be happy to embrace two simplified alternatives today. And maybe you guys can discuss with me later what the, the true world might look like. But we have two explanations why the birds fly together. The first explanation is there, that there is a cause that steers all birds in a certain way, a common cause. Uh, there is there were there were theories on this for bird flocking that God controlled the birds or that there's one particular bird that gives directions, which sounds ludicrous today, but 200 years ago that was entirely plausible, um, uh, explaining flocking behavior. And for measles or other infectious diseases, this is the correct answer. Measles symptoms cluster together because of a common cause, the infection, that won uh, a Nobel Prize in 1904, massive discovery, and we treat measles or bacterial infections with antibiotics because they fight the common cause. Super amazing discovery, correct, amazing. Now, I think for psychological attributes, uh, I work on depression. There is an alternative explanation, namely that depression symptoms cluster together, not because there's one captain bird, one god, one common cause, one infection, but because one item leads to the other. This is the case for birds in some way. So this is the true explanation for birds. We know this to be true. Or for swarms of fish, for example. And this is the case in, in ecosystems often, whether the weather, the lake, lake ecologists have been working on this for a long time. And I think it is also the case for depression. Now, are there also common causes for depression? Yes, of course. Um, but there are also relations between particular items, right? So the truth lies in between here somewhere. But I think the left side can be rejected wholeheartedly. There's not one cause for depression. That's not how, why the items correlate. Anyway, so um, I talked about this a little. Uh, PC means psychological construct here. Sorry, I should have removed that from the slides. Um, in this framework, uh, birds or symptoms or anything else are interchangeable. They're passive. They don't really matter. They only matter in as much as I want to measure the underlying common cause using observable indicators. And you guys, anybody who does latent variable modeling does that all the time. Um, nothing wrong with this, by the way. I, I think that's a very strong framework. I just don't think it applies to the things I work with on a daily basis. Importantly, if you want to intervene in this uh, system, you need to intervene on the cause, not the indicators, not the consequences. Um, And this is a nice graph by my Marcus Jokola. He put on Twitter a few years ago that I still keep using, where, which is a nice example of a common cause that everybody understands. And so in my field, um, so I'm the hand in this example and the panda bear is medicine and psychiatry and the ball is the common cause framework. And I've been trying for a few years now to convince folks that there are alternatives to understand and conceptualize mental health, but it has been a struggle for the panda bear and for me as well. Um, so. Network theory uh, is the idea, as I explained already, that we should focus on these elements instead of the whole big picture thing. And um, yeah, I think I, I, I spoke my piece on this. The interventions here then, of course, need to focus not on depression, which is not the thing itself here, but on the elements in the system. And that's how it works in other systems, uh, like the weather or uh, ecosystems like lakes. All right, um, now I need to move my zoom bar so I can actually read my heading. Yeah, this is a way too brief history. This is worth an, uh, just a 90 minute lecture by itself. So I have to do this very quickly. Um, clinicians have long thought about mental health problems as causal systems. Beck mentioned this in his 1961 book, for example, he doesn't call it a network, but it's very clear. Um, when you do a function analysis in CBT, a cognitive behavior therapy, then you also often think of, of mental health problems of vicious cycles and, and systems of feedback loops. But as a scientific discipline itself, this network approach, it, it became reinvigorated and gained lots of recognition and prominence when Danny Borsbaum wrote his 2008 paper on the topic that I have on the right side here that sort of started this. Um, and I often see uh, Boris, Danny, who's my mentor, by the way, I the world to him, um, but neither, he, but he would not say that he started this uh, network thing. Uh, and it would also be false to say that because many people had this idea much before 
and then he put it in focus of the clinical literature and then he and his team were able to provide folks with methods with statistical tools to estimate these networks which is a massive uh, um, step forward but when i hear you know the Wurzbaum lab invented network the network idea in clinical psychology that's just not true of course um, i recommend work by adele hayes and winter Schiepek, for example in austria who has done this stuff in the 80s and 90s um, but in ways that is not always accessible to me as a non-mathematician, I have to admit. Um, so Borsbaum and colleagues focused on the empirical study of mental health systems using network models, sometimes developed in the lab by themselves, sometimes often taken in, from physics and computer science and other network models. And their focus was on symptoms, but of course mental health problems are not just symptoms. Um, there are many more issues here. Is that sort of clear, the general setup here? Um, I wanted to make sure to provide this before we go into the statistics now, the reason why you guys got up in the morning. Regularization, partial correlations, conditional dependence relations, let's do it. So again, thank you to all these disciplines. The things I'm doing would not be possible without them. Uh, psychologists are, we have strong psychometricians, we have fantastic work and super brains, but a lot of the methods we're using are in part taken and uh, adopted from other disciplines, of course, and that's, that's fine. So the networks that I will talk about today uh, are estimated on data. And in that sense, they differ from the social networks I showed you before, because we have the nodes. I know the mean of a given person on a given variable, but I do not know how suicidal ideation and sad mood hang together. I don't know their statistical relation. I need a model to estimate that relation on the right side. And we will, I will briefly cover how to do this today. So, um, here on the left side, this is a table from a primer paper I'll show you in a second. Um, so there are three types of, of data sets and three types of network models, very, very broadly speaking. First is cross-sectional data. About 80% of the work in our field has been done in this type of data. I think that's nice for the beginning, but I think the, there's more interesting work to do now um, where you, everybody knows what that is. I don't need to talk about this in great detail. You see an example here. The second type of data is time series data, can be with one person only or with multiple people. Um, there's lots of stuff on the slide, ignore it. Just to give you a very rough intro, I'll talk all, about all of this in more detail. And then the third uh, type of data is panel data, which is quite typical in our field where you have uh, epidemiological data, for example, with five or six measurement points that doesn't quite qualify as time series data. This is the data type I will not talk about today because it's the most recent for which we develop models. But psychometrics, not psychometrics, but with an N, psychometrics.org, uh, or psychometrics is an R package by Sasha Epscom that can handle panel data. If anybody's interested, you can check that out. <clears throat> okay, this is a primer paper that was published just a couple of weeks ago, uh, actually months ago now that I look at it, where, where, what is time anyway, but um, in the Nature Reviews Methods primers, and it has a lot of things I will be talking about today. Um, and I, if you read one paper on this, I recommend that primer paper. I think it's, it came out really nicely. All right, the tools I'll talk about now are super massive simplifications in the way that Newton's theory of gravitation is a super massive simplification of how gravitation works. Um, but it's ho hopefully these, these can be still useful tools, although of course they don't um, reflect reality in all its complexities. I don't think that can be our goal or needs to be our goal anyway. But yeah, keep in mind that I'll talk about fairly simple models. Today, I just have a couple of names here because I want to give a shout out to colleagues. This is outdated probably. There's tons more people here. Uh, so uh, apologies to everybody who's not included here. These are just people who came to mind immediately working on this. And I will talk today about the pairwise markov random field, a particular type of network model. There are many others, but this model is quite prevalent in the literature, and it estimates partial correlations or conditional dependence relations. Now I'm going to open my thing so I can see your faces. Does anybody know what conditional dependence relations are or what we estimate them? That's sort of an important takeaway today, so I want to take a minute here. Anybody bold enough to just yell into the void? Some, uh, really an answer to a very difficult question. So why do we try to model conditional dependence relations or partial correlations? rather than zero order correlations, the way that many psychologists do it, for example. 
why are we interested in A predicting B, controlling for C? Why do we control for C? Maybe it's a trivial question, actually. Making it awkward for everybody. I'm sorry, guys. Well, I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> I mean, we think when we're doing it, I guess that we're in some way um, removing the influence of this other variable that's, you know, is dependent on it also, and isolating the specific effect by removing all the other correlators. Yeah, that's it. I think that's all, and that's probably a good idea. Pearl has written about this a lot. Um, Julia Pearl in his primer on causality. Uh, if there would be a Nobel Prize for causality, it would be Pearl's. Uh, he has really revolutionized the field. I find this 2001 book a little hard to read, but there have been more recent books that are a little easier, I think, for, for me at least to understand. Um, and the idea is like a partial correlation in psychology. If I want, if so, uh, help me here. If Can you see me? I think you can, you guys can see me. So if A causes B and that causes C, right? We have three simple variables and there are arrows from here to here and from here to here. What is the zero order correlation between A and C? Assuming A fully causes B and B fully causes C. What is the zero order correlation between A and C? It is one. Weirdly enough, A and C are fully correlated but they stop to be correlated once I take into account B. Once I partial out the effect of B, A and C are independent. Or Pearl would say A and B are conditionally independent on B. And that's what we're really after. Now, can network models give you causality? No, nothing can, I personally think. But the idea is to derive at least at a causal skeleton. And if A causes B causes C, if you do a conditional independence network the way we learn it today, you will indeed get A and B are connected, B and C are connected, but A and C are independent from each other. There's no connection there, the way we want to recover, okay? So that's my very short primer. I can't do it in, in more time today, but that's my very short uh, primer on why we do conditional dependence modeling. Judea Pearl has more answers for you. Um, but this is not a psychology thing. This is when we want to recover causal structures generally, okay? We can do this in many ways. There's an icing model for binary data. There's a mixed graphical model for mixed data types. There's a Gaussian graphical model for, for normal data or ordinal data. There are many fancy models that, are, that do interactions and nonlinear stuff. I will talk about Gaussian data only today, specifically the Gaussian graphical model. If you model this with the R package bootnet, uh, all of these models, many of these models will be possible in the uh, R code. You just say estimate network bracket, data, whatever, and then you say, what model do you want? Do you want the easing model? Do you want the mixed graphical model? Do you want the Gaussian graphical model? And so forth. They're all implemented in the same package. Uh, here are a few R packages. This is again from the primer paper in, in Nature, so you don't need to keep this in mind. You can just look at it later. But there's a few things you can do there, which is nice. Um, and now I already explained this, so I will do this very briefly. This, these are correlations of 20 or 16 PTSD symptoms, zero order correlations. They're all positive, of course, because problems can go together in psychology. Um, then now here you have the partial correlations and you see lots of negative edges popping up here. And that's sort of counterintuitive and not in alignment with what we know about PTSD. And this is why the models we use in the literature are regularized, lasso regularized partial correlation models, which remove small spurious problems due to multiple testing. So in the middle network here, all the negative stuff and some of the positive stuff is simply because you do so many correlations or partial correlations. And on the right side, we trim those down. Uh, it's a bit like a multiple testing control or error control. And you get a more sparse network that is also easier to interpret. And you retain nearly no negative edges, uh, which is good because we wouldn't expect them, theoretically speaking. And there's many, many simulation papers showing that this model performs quite well. There are many other ways to deal with this issue. Lasso regularization is one of many. Is it the best? Definitely not. Or is it, I don't know if it's the best. It depends on what your data is and, and your sample size and so forth. But I need to talk about one model today and this is the most established one. Um, there are problems with lasso regularization like with any other regularization or multiple testing correction. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, I think I think this makes sense, obviously, for um, visualizing and interpreting a single network. But also, it's it kind of feels like you're throwing away information and it, like adding in some threshold that is fundamentally going to be arbitrary to some extent to determine. Yeah. So, yeah, how, I guess how do you think about that? 
Yeah, so simulation studies can show us what the threshold needs to be to recover only the true stuff and not to recover not true stuff. But of course, I don't know the true network here, so I don't know what simulation study I should base my results on. But there are pretty good parameters established in the literature uh, on physical networks usually, but also now in psychological data. So the thresholds that the Lasso regularization uses works okay, I think. And then your question, and you, in, so I'll, there's a paper on it here, and the, it really works a bit like a p-value, which I like. So there's a tuning parameter you can choose as a researcher, and it's a bit like a type one versus type two error kind of parameter, where you can choose, do you want to err on the side of discovery, accidentally finding edges that aren't in the data, or do you want to err on the side of being more careful and sparse, and, and then uh, possibly missing out on uh, true edges in the, in the data that you don't recover then in the network model. So it's a bit of a sensitivity specificity idea. And the more you go in one direction, the worse the other direction goes, of course. Okay, it's interesting. Maybe we'll talk about it tomorrow in our session as we're moving towards personalized networks. It feels silly to impose a cutoff when we're you know, estimating for each person overall connectivity, but we can talk more about that. Yeah, so especially in low power settings, you discover you would retrieve a lot of stuff that isn't in the data set due to small spurious stuff happening. And then I'd be worried that your network is 80% edges that aren't actually there uh, due to just chance estimation and stuff like that. That's why generally I recommend some sort of thresholding, but yeah, there are many and it depends on the model what you would use. Um, yeah, I would have thought if there were chance they're going to, uh, if you average across a bunch of people, all those networks will go anyway in, the, in that process, right? It does exactly that happens. So if you compare, actually, if you have data set one and data set two, and you want to compare those network structures, you don't need to regularize because you will estimate too much stuff here and too much stuff here. But that's fine because on average, these will partially, you will just want to compare them anyway, right? So um, for these purposes, I think it's completely fine. But it's a big discussion. There's really no true answer here. My take is that for most of these estimations, they're underpowered and it's good to have some sort of level of correction. And I show this example here because it's a very obvious example where problems occur that don't occur if you have any sort of thresholding. Um, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, good question, Claire. Thanks, thanks for chiming in. So just briefly, I don't want to take too much time with the cross-sectional stuff. It's already uh, 225. Uh, paper on replicability of network models where um, I needed to travel the countries to get four data sets on PTSD, which turned out to be quite challenging. This is less fun on Zoom, so I'll just do this quickly. This is, of course, not Paris, but Las Vegas, as you guys caught. And then I was traveling in Arizona. And then, oh my God, how cheesy. I forgot I had this slide animation in here. And this is Iceland, and this is Austria, weirdly enough, in front of the museum. And now this is the moment where I was able to actually get all the four data sets, which I, I, I honestly, I'm not kidding. This was a lot of work. For one of the data sets, I needed to be in Denmark in like a military base and somebody was looking over my shoulder while analyzing the data. Um, so these are just the four network models now. I will not include good details here. Um, you don't want to visually compare them. You want to run statistical tests for comparison like you will do with every any other statistical model. Um, but some stuff replicates pretty well. And obviously nightmares and sleep problems are strongly connected everywhere because they're the same kind of thing to some degree, right? So we would expect this though. Um, still shows that the model works to some degree. Um, and then uh, other relations are absent, for example, in data set four, which is a very different data set. These are folks with very, very severe trauma type, often trauma type two, who I think one third of them have psychotic symptoms due to the severity of the trauma. They're all mostly refugees coming to Denmark. Um, whereas the third data set is military veterans, mostly white, mostly male, less severe traumas, and so on. So um, this, um, maybe also relevant, amnesia is the least connected node in the network. And if you run a factor model on this um, due to equivalence of models, amnesia would be the item with the lowest factor loading on any of the factors, therefore. Um, so connectedness in a network model is quite similar to a factor loading in, uh, in a factor model. And then you can estimate stuff like centrality, which means how connected is the variable in the whole network structure. And as I showed you before, amnesia is the least connected node, obviously the four colors are the four data sets. So this, what we can learn about this for PTSD is a very open question. This, I'm just gonna do a statistical talk today before I come to the problems of inference and so on. So this is just node connectedness, not more than that here. Uh, another example of what you can do with these cross-sectional networks here, these are 500 folks 
half of them lost their partner. So 500 folks were uh, followed over time and half of them lost their partner and half of them didn't lose their partner. So that's the loss note here. So a spousal, spousal bereavement, zero versus one. This is a group membership note. And then uh, I think a year later, folks were asked about a couple of depression symptoms. And so this edge here between loss and lonely, so all edges between loss and the rest of the network structure are temporal uh, because this event happened before and it's not possible that being lonely a year from now causes my partner to die to uh, last year, right? So we know this not causal perhaps, but at least temporal. And so um, you can see that folks who have a loss event, which is coded as a one uh, in this loss note, not as a zero, are more likely than folks who have no loss event to be, for example, lonely, less happy, and so on in the future. Just as an example of, this doesn't necessarily have to be cross-sectional per se, um, if you are a little creative. And then we can estimate predictability of the node, which is the gray circle around each node. And predictability means the amount of variance in this node explained by all other nodes in the network structure. It's a bit like R square that psychologists know. And that can be quite insightful here. It's all roughly 50%. I don't know, this is maybe 60%. This is maybe 35%. But you have cases like the one with insomnia I showed you before. Let me see if I can get there. Do you see that here on the in this note? I'm not sure if you guys see my mouse cursor actually. Um, yeah. So you can see there's pretty much no explained variance in this note here. You can barely see even the gray area. It's a little more here, but um, it's also a reflection. If a node has very few connections and they're weak, of course, R square will also be weak. It's um, just to show you a couple of tools. Okay, now for the more interesting part, time series models. Again, a couple of names um, important. You can do this in a single person or in multiple people, which I think is really cool. There are many types of models available, such as M plus, the uh, dynamic structural equation model in M plus, the GIMI package uh, by uh, Katie Gates and, and, and colleagues, Peter Molinar. Um, there are time varying models, network models that can change over time, but need a billion data points. So that's really hard to do in psychology with enough power, unfortunately. But I will talk about the vector autoregressive model quite commonly used in our field and in other fields like uh, econometrics. And um, this model is stationary. There's no changes allowed because that would require too many parameters to estimate. So keep that in mind. Same for GIMI, I believe. Same for DSEM actually as well. Uh, stationary models are most more common because they're just so much easier to estimate. And these are based on time series data, which we often collect on smartphones. You guys probably know what EMA is. Um, and the model will give you three networks. I will talk about two today. It will give you a contemporaneous network. That means how is a given variable at a given beep related to another variable at the same beep? So it's a bit like a cross-sectional network in that sense. We have no directed edges because it happens at the same time, but I think these are super informative, the contemporaneous networks. And then we have the temporal networks. Um, how do variables at the prior time point predict variables at the next time point, like lag one um, in these models? Is that clear? Okay. I'll go through some examples. This is a paper published last year, actually this year, um, in which I should have added a slide here. So we um, were, I, I was running a bachelor project here with eight students and we had an EMA study prepared and then COVID happened. And I called the ethics committee like on a Sunday night to amend my protocol to be able to ask a couple of COVID related questions because the study happened March, 2020, which was literally just the onset of the pandemic here. And so we, could, we were able to collect EMA data during the very first onset of cases going out, people dying and so on to see what happens to student mental health. Uh, so we ended up actually publishing it. And this is the contemporaneous network structure. Again, same beep. Just to explain a little what this means. So when people were outdoors, then at the same time, they were less likely to be at home. Duh. But good to know that the estimation works, right? I just do this. Uh, I, I didn't think of this relation when collecting the data. Um, my I, variables are selected by students who want to work on these, these items. Um, so there's a super convenience. But it's good to see that you know things pan out the way they should pan out. More interestingly, so these six items here are all coded in a way that higher is worse. Even when it says relax, the item is in a, in, unable to relax. Or when it says future, it means sort of worrying about the future. And you can see a positive manifold among those makes sense. We often see this when people have one problem, they have others at the same time. Usually they're positively related. Um, being alone 
is positively related to worrying about the future and, and anhedonia, five and six. And there's some other stuff that's interesting, which I won't go into detail because you guys get the idea. I can see your faces. Everybody's like, what's happening here? That's uh, yes, temporal network structures are a little bit more crowded and a bit messier to interpret. Um, I will talk you through something that I found interesting in this data set. Where do we start? Let's start at eight. When you're alone, you're more, so on average, for the average person, and it's a big question if that's a good idea to interpret data like this, but for the average person in this model and in this data, being alone at a given time point makes people, predicts, not makes, makes, predicts at the next time point people to worry about COVID-19, at the next time point then they're occupied with COVID-19, um, meaning our item was like, do you read the news about it or something, do you actively engage with like, bad stuff about COVID-19, Facebook and so forth, the search of information, which at the next time point leads to folks uh, feeding anhedonia. And now you can see feedback loops to five and to one, these double arrows here. Um, so these could be vicious cycles, six and five and six and one, which inability to relax. Um, and six then feeds back into, wait, where is that? Well, five feeds back into eight and you get this, this circle going round and round and round. But again, this is just Granger causality. A precedes B and A is related to B statistically. It doesn't give us cause, of course. None of these models can um, without interventions, in my opinion. Anyway, I think it's interesting data. It's freely available. If anybody wants to play around with time series data, you can just uh, download it. And, and I have my code online for this paper too, as for all my papers, uh, which might provide a good starting point for using these models in time series data, if anybody's interested. Uh, my favorite section, <laughs> challenges. Oh, wait, there's a chat. Oh, yeah, thanks, Claire. Um, my favorite uh, section is uh, challenges. I've, I've wrote a paper I really enjoyed with Anjali Kramer, 2017, on, on Ways Forward, and uh, was able to publish a, a paper a couple of months ago in Psych Inquiry on sort of big questions in network models, problems of theory. Uh, and I have four YouTube talks on my YouTube channel on, on this for the Network Analysis Summer School last year, two years ago, what, last year, last year, online edition. Uh, so anyone, if anybody's interested in, in stuff like this, um, you, you can look it up there. I'll just talk about a couple of problems so we have time for discussions. Um, statistical models are able to retrieve certain things from data. And Jonas Hasselbeck and colleagues in their recent paper show that, for example, the Gaussian graphical model here, the one I talked about now in cross-sectional data, can retrieve feedback loops with a, you know, a little star. But if the relations in the feedback loop are asymmetric, one is stronger than the other, it cannot retrieve that properly. Of course not, because there's only one edge between two variables. If there are different time scales happen or higher order interactions, or if the system has multiple stable states, the GGM is not able to retrieve that. Right? So this is just, Jonas Hasselbeck, who is awesome and probably wrote the best PhD in the entire world ever. Like um, the, I remember when I, I was there for the defense and the, well, uh, I think EJ Wachenmacher said, Jonas carpet bombed them with papers in his PhD. Like it was this like 500 page thing. So he's an amazing scholar, but he is a little grumpy sometimes and a little very skeptical, even more than me. But this is a very good way to show that the models we use cannot actually recover some of the things that we believe are there theoretically and that why we use the models in the first place, right? So that's just a good, good uh, thing to keep in mind. In these discussions, more practical people like Danny, for example, would sometimes then say, yes, of course, models are just the lower bond of complexity. That's fine. They're just models. That's their purpose. Um, they are, you need to simplify the world in some way to make sense of it. So I think that's an interesting debate. And I, the second link here is my, my view on this issue um, in, in which I write about it a little bit. In some. Another issue is model equivalence. I think that's really important to understand today. So in cross-sectional data, I can simulate a network model on the left side. So I'm God now, I make a data set, I, sorry, I make a data set from a network model. And then I can fit the factor model on the right side to this data set and get perfect fit. In the same way, I can make the data set on the right side, the model, sorry, I can make a data set from the model on the right side. The true model is now a factor model and I can fit a network model on the left with perfect fit. That is because these two models are equivalent to each other, at least mostly. Riet van Borg has a nice paper saying they're not exactly equivalent, but for all practical matters, I think they're equivalent. And so just make sure that when you fit a network model, you don't say my data come from causal complexity or something, right? 
because even if your data were generated by a common cause, you can totally fit a network model to it and get a good fit to your data set. So keep your statistical inferences separate from your causal inferences. Here is the message. And uh, this is cross-sectional data here. Temporal data helps with equivalence a little bit, but not fully. There's still many, many equivalent models in time series data. And just because a model fit doesn't mean it retrieves your true structure in the data. Um, it's the time. Yeah, I think we're good. This is from Hiro uh, Mati on his uh, website. I really like this. Um, just showing that depending on the time scale you look at, depending on the lag you choose in your model, you get different parameters. Um, so if you lose, use the red line, for example, if you measure every 400 time points, a time point can be a minute here. You get a downward slope. But if you use the, the blue line, which isn't that different, it's like 350 time points, you get an upward slope in your data. right? So just good to keep in mind that lags really matter. And um, obviously, there's no right answer how to do objectively do this, but it's good to worry about it sometimes at night, I feel. Let's not forget this. Uh, this stuff is difficult. This is from my own paper. Uh, colleagues approached me with the data set of 27,000 people. I was very excited to work with a big data set five years ago or so on schizotypal personality traits. We fit a network model and only after I was done and I handed in the results to the first author, I, I sort of looked at the items and the strongest edge in our network structure was, do you often feel that other people have it in for you? And I often feel that others have it in for me. And uh, yeah, obviously these are connected and it gives us exactly no information about a causal skeleton here or anything else. It just tells us that we measured the same item, pretty much exactly the same item twice, right? So like any other model, if what you put in is what you get out, that network models are mostly just regressions. And so all criticism and problems of regressions apply for network models. And if you put in your same variable twice, then yeah, that'll be a problem for inference, uh, unless you simply draw statistical inferences. Um, and the last problem I struggled with, um, and I think I want to talk about this a little more. So uh, I think network modeling is difficult. You need statistics and you need some math and uh, not all of us are trained in this properly. And there are problems when people use models they don't understand that not only applies to network models, right? Um, I cannot solve this, but it's if you struggle with this, like I do get collaborators who know these models well or understand these issues better or can help you with inference and so forth. I think uh, we need to collaborate more anyway. And um, I struggle with the math part. And so I've been lucky enough that I had access to fantastic collaborators like Sasha Epscombe or Laura Bringman or many other brilliant people in our area that, um, that yeah, uh, compliment me. And vice versa, Sasha would always, well, not always, Sasha would sometimes invite me to quote ICOFI, quote, end quote his papers um, to make them a little bit more accessible maybe for the non-stats non readers. All right, uh, end of uh, end of lecture thingy. Um, I think it would be nice if we start going beyond just fitting models to data. I've been doing this for a few years and I'm getting antsy. So my personal take on this is that there are three generations of network papers so far. First gen was sort of just fit data to, uh, to take data collected for another purpose and fit a network model on it cross-sectionally. I think that's valuable, uh, generating hypothesis. Then the second generation is a little bit more careful about the measurements, uh, like what nodes do we put into network models. And there's also the idea to actually test things in data rather than just explore um, data in a data-driven way. And I think the third generation are formal models and formal theories. Um, and I, will, I think I have an example here. This is from Don Robbins, Don Robino's work, um, Harvard. And these are many, many theories about how panic disorder evolves. And interestingly, all of these have a vicious cycle at the heart uh, of, of this um, framework. And so Don and colleagues uh, were able to implement these theories in a formal statistical model, formal computational model, where uh, these are, this is just a network model. These are nodes and edges, but some of these, uh, some of these edges are slower and some of these edges are faster. The gray box edges go on a faster time loop time frame than the out of gray box edges. Some of them are negative and positive, and all of these are difference equations, meaning they're not just linear relations, but they're difference equations, nonlinear relations based on literature in, for example, uh, experiments with animals and so on, on oxygen intake and so forth. So this is a bit of a fancier network model. And um, 
you can make data from it and then you can see if it matches real world data on panic attacks, which is, I think, really awesome. So if you uh, read not one, but two papers after this, I would recommend the primary paper and then as a second paper, this paper by Don, which is very, uh, very accessible actually, given the complexity on, uh, on the topic. Um, I'll skip my stuff, not relevant enough. I, yeah, I want to thank team Danny Borsboom, as I said here. Danny has been my mentor, and I, I sort of grew up um, as a postdoc in Danny's lab, uh, specifically Sasha Abskamp, who has been tremendously helpful uh, as one of many people, and the ERC for funding my work, and you guys for listening. So at the very end, there's just a couple of resources. I don't need to go through these in detail. There's websites for tutorials. There's a whole week of summer schools online for free YouTube videos for an entire week. Um, that you can find in the slides, primary paper. We have a, we started a little lab group on Facebook like four years ago with Sasha and Adela. And now there are like 4,000 people in there and people I don't know answer really good, sorry, people I don't know ask really good questions I can answer and other people I don't know answer these questions. So we've been able to create a really nice community of folks interested in, in, in networks and in dynamics and psychology. Um, in hindsight, we should have not given it this name because sometimes we get questions about psychoanalysis um, which had not been the original idea of this group. Um, and last not but not least, sometimes we check packages, uh, papers citing our, our work or our, our packages. And uh, this is um, on the left side. So there are two types of uh, patrol and detection dogs on the police, which I didn't know. There are multiple breeds in each. And so the people here, you have the breeds on the left and right side, and the people estimated relations among behaviors of these of these dog breeds, and you can see that these behavior relations are different across different breeds of dogs, which is an awesome reminder that networks are universal and used in many uh, many disciplines. Thank you for paying attention and for being.